briefing in 2007 on the hope of our industry and the hope that our industry brings to treating diseases and disorders. I'm sure all of you know this, but for those of you who do not, Bio is the trade association representing 1,100 companies that are developing products in healthcare, food and ag, and industrial and environmental biotechnology. We organize these briefings to give you a sense of the excitement that we feel knowing our companies are on the cutting edge and creating products that will change and improve the health and environment of our society. I would like to thank the Biotech Caucus co-chairs, Congressman Chimkis and Rush, and their offices for sponsoring us on the Hill. I'd also like to thank Congressman Langevin and Amy Judge in his office who helped us get this room. Additionally, I'd like to thank the Institute for Alternative Futures, the Endocrine Society, and the Obesity Action Coalition who have joined us for this briefing. And finally, I want to thank our industry sponsors, Amgen, Amlin Pharmaceuticals, GlaxoSmithKline, Novo Nordisk, Orexigen Therapeutics, and Sanofi Aventis. With that, I'd like to turn this panel over to Dr. Bill Rowley from the Institute for Alternative Futures, who will bring, paint you a picture of the obesity epidemic and, the moder and moderate the remainder of the briefing. Good afternoon. They have given me five minutes, so I'm going to talk real fast. There are two handouts and no slides. Uh, if you take a look at the first map, it shows what's happened with obesity over a 15-year period. In 2015, that's a little more than seven years from now, 41% of all of the adults in America are going to be obese, according to extrapolations from Johns Hopkins University. If you happen to live in Mississippi or West Virginia, over 50% of the population is going to be obese. And you can see all the states in between. Clearly, obesity is becoming a huge problem for America. It's a big problem because people who are obese have other medical conditions, chronic diseases, disability, early deaths. If you take a look at the back side, you see what's happening with diabetes, primarily because of obesity. Right now, about 25 million Americans have diabetes. And 18 years from now, in 2025, that number is going to double. Taking a look at it from the perspective of an employer, here's a recent study from Duke University. They found that severely obese employees filed twice as many workers' compensation claims, had seven times higher health care costs, and missed 13 times more days from work. So you can imagine the impact of obesity on American businesses and are trying to be competitive in the global economy. The conventional wisdom, of course, is that obesity is an individual's problem. If we just took responsibility for our behavior, if we ate healthy and got exercise, it would no longer be a problem, right? That's, that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. Well, I've got a role model for you. There is a segment of society where health and fitness are very important. Physical activity is part of daily life. They are measured twice a year, and there are significant career consequences if you are not fit and overweight. And yet, right now, 62% of active duty military personnel are overweight. That really begs the question, if they can't stay within weight standards, what's the hope for the rest of America? It's got to be more than just saying to individuals that it's their problem. Well, I want to give you three stories about the future. What might happen over the next few years? The first story is that we're all in denial. We don't do anything, we don't see a problem, and we get bigger and bigger. Finally, we realize that we're obese, but we also realize how hard it is to do anything about it, so we just accept it. We focus our attention on adapting society to obesity. The disability and chronic disease costs skyrocket. But what do you suppose we do as a society? We become incensed. We're incensed that airlines don't have wider seats. We want the Americans with Disabilities Act to be expanded. 
We want more wheelchair access for 500 pound capacity wheelchairs. Can you imagine that being where we're heading? Kind of looks like we're going there right now, doesn't it? There's another possibility, which is typically American. We're going to leave it to our healthcare system. Piece of cake, we're going to let high technology solve it for us so that we don't have to make any changes ourselves. So if we look out a few years from now, we see that millions of people have had bariatric surgery. 150 million Americans take a combination of three or four sophisticated pills every day to deal with metabolism and hunger and changes in fat cells and things like that. Yes, technology is going to make a big difference. However, it is not going to be cheap if we have 150 million people taking medicines. There's another possibility, and that's that we as a society wake up and decide that we are going to change our behavior in our obesogenic environment. So we work to make sure that kids do go to healthy schools where there's decent school lunches and physical activity. We make sure that Americans are eating healthy food in the right portion size. And we change our built environment so that people can get physical activity in their daily lives and also at work. Now, what's going to happen? The first story I told you is a non-starter because there is not enough money in our entire economy to pay for all the disease we're creating. What about the other two? I don't think either story by itself is the right answer. I think it's going to take a combination. I think it's going to take advances in biotechnology wisely applied, and I think it's going to take America waking up and realizing that we are all responsible to some degree for solving this problem. That means that we're going to have to change our minds. We're going to have four speakers now, and they're not going to get a whole lot more time than I did, but they're going to give you different perspectives of what's going on with the obesity epidemic. The first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Gilbert August from the Endocrine Society. And while he's coming up, you've all got the bios, so you can learn more about them. Thank you. Well, good, a good afternoon. It's a pleasure being here. It seems funny to uh, be talking about obesity while everybody is eating, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> okay. um, first speaker spoke about the uh, huge increase in obesity and overweight in this country, and it also applies to uh, children as well. Uh, what we use to define obesity uh, in both adults and in children is a body mass index, or the BMI. And that's merely a, an estimate that relates the uh, amount of excessive fat in the body to the weight and height of a particular individual. Now, we are concerned about obesity uh, because it's associated, as you heard, with an increase in cardiovascular disease risk factors and also with an increasing incidence of uh, type 2 diabetes. And I think it's important to realize that childhood obesity is a predictor of what's going to happen in the adult. If the child at one to two years of age is overweight and has a BMI over the 85th percentile, the adult, as an adult, or a young adult, that, ch that adult will have a 1.5 increased risk of developing obesity or being overweight. If the adolescent at 15 to 17 years of age is merely overweight, then there is a 17-fold increase in the likelihood of being overweight as an adult and increasing the cardiovascular risk factors and the chance of developing diabetes mellitus.
Okay. We have, oh, over there. Okay. There it goes. Okay. So how, how, should, we, uh, how should we deal with this problem? Well, ultimately, the, uh, the best treatment is going to be prevention. And you can follow all of these, uh, all of these suggestions primarily following the same way that uh, we developed an anti-smoking program uh, several decades ago. And just like an anti-smoking uh, program, success is going to take one to two generations. So we aren't going to know for a long time how effective we've been in this program. But the anti-smoking program did work by educating starting in the elementary schools. Some of you may remember your children coming home from school chiding you for smoking. And you told the teachers you didn't like that. <laughs> okay, but in the meanwhile, we still have a very large population of overweight and obese individuals, both adults and children. And how do we deal with that situation? We want to deal not only with treating the obese population, but also the overweight population, because it's easier to lose a few pounds than to lose an awful lot of pounds if you're o obese. Now, for the growing child who hasn't attained his adult or her adult height yet, the situation is a little different than it is an adult, because all one has to do is really what's called weight maintenance, that is, not gain any additional weight while the child is still growing. So weight maintenance in the child is the equivalent of weight loss in the adult. Now, we push something called lifestyle modification, and uh, you know, I know everybody inwardly groans that this stuff doesn't work, but in reality it does work. It won't work if all that is involved is your family doctor giving you a diet sheet, telling you to exercise more, and see you back in a year. That will not work. What works is an intensive program of lifestyle modification, which involves teaching dietary changes, what kind of physical education, what kind of physical activity is needed, and most of all, behavioral modifications so that you learn how to deal with stressful situations that might involve overeating. The problem is, well, I didn't advance it yet. <laughs> the problem is uh, that this is not well reimbursed. And so there is really a disincentive for the healthcare professional to provide these services to the, to the patient. So there are additional treatments which are available. And in children, we do recommend pharmacotherapy in obese children who have failed lifestyle modification, or in overweight children who have failed lifestyle modification and have severe comorbidities associated with obesity. But the results of pharmacotherapy are really only modest. It's, it provides a modest addition to what can be accomplished with lifestyle modification. And you're talking in terms of only about an additional weight loss of, of 10 pounds or so. But it's also important to realize that it takes only a 5% reduction in your weight to decrease the cardiovascular risk factors associated with obesity. And that is certainly uh, doable. But if you're looking to fit into a bikini, uh, that's a much more difficult proposition. Surgery is currently reserved only for those with the severest forms of obesity, uh, BMI over 50 or BMI of over 40 with significant comorbidities. The message to remember is that treatment is expensive and prevention is cheap. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Antonio Tatarani, who's uh, Vice President of Medical Metabolism at Sanofi Aventis 
U.S. pharmaceuticals. And he's going to talk about the current groundbreaking treatments. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be here. I um, do work for, for uh, Sanofi Aventis, uh, uh, but I have spent most of my professional life really researching the causes and thinking about the treatment uh, of obesity. And sorry to open with this rather grueling image uh, while you're eating, but I think I need to make a very clear point, and that is that obesity uh, is a disease, uh, and it is a disease because it leads to all of the health consequences that you see listed on this slide. Uh, and specifically, how does this thing work? Next page. Specifically, we need to pay attention to the fact uh, that obesity leads uh, with a great degree. Yeah, this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with uh, increases tremendously the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. And it does that because when excessive fat accumulates in the body, it accumulates where it shouldn't be, which is in tissues that are not usually. Uh, populated by the presence of uh, fat tissue, but also because fat, and this is a discovery that has happened in the last 10, 15 years, is really an endocrine organ that is able to produce a number of substances that affect uh, health processes. Now, what is the cost of not treating obesity? You can read for yourself the numbers in this slides. The cost of not treating obesity is the cost of not preventing the majority of its consequences and, in, and, and its impact on uh, health costs uh, in this nation as uh, in other uh, nations around the world where obesity is uh, prevalent. Uh, and that has to do with preventing, as I said, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, diabetes, and their impact on the healthcare system. Now you can uh, tell me, Dr. Tartarani, what, what are you really talking about here? There are perfectly effective and potent treatments for each of these conditions that you have listed on the slide. There are, there are treatments for hypercholesterolemia, there are treatments for hypertension, there are treatments for diabetes. That is correct. There are potent treatments for each of these conditions. But um, a phenomenon that is very well known to epidemiologists, and it's becoming clearer and clearer to clinicians and other, and other stakeholders in this process, it's what is called uh, residual cardiovascular risk. It is very well known that these potent treatments for dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes will lower by a certain extent the risk of future cardiovascular disease, but there will be a remaining residual risk, which is quite substantial, and the current understanding is that this is driven by the underlying condition of obesity by a variety of mechanisms that include something like subclinical inflammation, accumulation of visceral fat, and insulin resistance. So we're talking about the treatment of obesity, and so let's ask ourselves the question, what are the options for the treatment of obesity and its uh, comorbidities? And you have heard some of this already mentioned by the previous speaker. There is the option of not treating obesity, and that will continue to maintain a very high pressure on the epidemics of these diseases that we are experiencing at this point, cardiovascular disease, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes. This nation, as well as many other nations around the, the uh, westernized uh, world, are spending a tremendous amount of time and resources in trying to resolve this issue by using uh, non-prescription, herbal, and dietary supplements that are absolutely uh, inefficacious and most uh, sometimes they're all also not safe. Diet and exercise and behavior, you have heard it is the treatment of choice, but it has a very high rate, rate of uh, failure. Pharmacotherapy, I'll spend the next minute, minute and a half uh, discussing. And bariatric surgery is today the most effective way of treating this condition, but it has some complications. These are the guidelines for the treatment of obesity. And you see that behavior and uh, intervention and exercise 
are recommended across the whole range starting from overweight all the way to severe obesity. Pharmacotherapy is indicated for people with a BMI over 27 and associated comorbidities and above, and surgery is indicated for people with a BMI of 35 and above with associated comorbidity or a BMI of 40. So what is the status, the current status of drug and drug development? And I guess this is my uh, most important message to you. Uh, there are st drugs that are approved in this country for the long-term use in obesity, and you see them listed here. Orlistat is an over-the-counter medication, and Cybutramin is the only prescription drug that is currently approved in the U.S. for the treatment of obesity. And there is an, a list of other con uh, medications, some approved for short-term, which are not really very useful for the treatment of obesity, which is a chronic condition. Some that are not approved for obesity but are used because the need is so great that people go into other treatment schemes just to receive the benefits of weight loss. There are some drugs that are not approved in this country but approved in the rest of the world, such as Rimonaband, which is a CB1 receptor antagonist. And there are some drugs that hopefully are, are going to come to fruition in not so distant future, Taranabant and other CB1 receptor inverse agonists other CB1 receptor modulators, a list of other drugs, and most important, in combination. So the, the, the key message in this slide is that we have very little pharmacological help right now. There is a whole class of drugs which is called CB1 receptor antagonist that is developing and might be soon on the market in this country. And there is the great promise of combination. I have two slides and I will go very fast. This is what um, the success for obesity treatment is considered by the, the World Health Organization. And I will point at the fact that anything below a 5 to 10 percent weight loss is considered clinically significant, which means it's associated with improvement in the associated comorbidities. And the, the, what is the uh, promise of pharmacotherapy at this point is a moderate weight loss with na weight normalization reached only by surgical treatment. We hope that drugs with a novel mechanism of action and or combination te therapy will bring us closer to that. This is my conclusion slide. The conclusion is, I think, one that we need to reflect on very, very carefully. We need to treat this condition, this disease, and the future for the treatment of obesity and its associated comorbidities is really the advent to the market of drugs with a novel mechanism of action and or combination therapy. But we need to keep in mind that we have some very serious problem to overcome as a society of people that is interested in this problem. Number one, obesity is still not universally recognized as a disease. And here we could discuss the rest of the afternoon for why that is, but um, the problem is that this remains one of the greatest unmet medical needs of our time. Uh, there is only one prescription drug in the U.S. for this devastating condition. So we need to hope that this will change in the foreseeable future. And as it was mentioned before, access to these medicines for obese patients remains the biggest hurdle because obesity treatment is still considered a lifestyle intervention and many countries don't reimburse these medications. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Michael Crowley, who's the Chief Scientific Officer of Erection, Erexigen, I'll never say it right, it's, it's got too many letters in it, Erexigen um, Therapeutics Incorporated, and his talk is The Promise of Biotechnology, What's in the Pipeline? Thank you. Well, thanks for your interest and attention here. I'm going to try and work these slides also. Um, <clears throat> Is there a trick? Am I holding my tongue the wrong way? There we go. Okay. By way of background, I run a, an obesity research lab at a primate center in Oregon and a couple of years ago founded Erexigen Therapeutics, which has an interest in this field, as you probably imagine. So we've heard that current therapeutic options really are not helping enough people 
and there's a variety of reasons why that's the case. We, we've been through that, so I'm not going to waste too much time addressing it. Uh, I'm instead going to focus mostly on, on what future drug therapies might offer in this field. This is a busy slide, and we're going to take a little bit of time to go through it. But over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a tremendous amount of research devoted to trying to understand energy fluxes within the body. What happens when food's absorbed or taken into the mouth, absorbed by the GI tract, petitioned out into different stores within the body, and then how the brain interprets signals from the body about where that energy is, what the nutrient load the gut is, how big your adipose stores are. And the brain then uses that information to make decisions about whether to increase or decrease your appetite and increase or decrease the rate at which you're burning energy. So this sort of global picture forms where we have energy fluxes moving around. And from that very complicated understanding, and the scientific literature is full of people's schematic diagrams of how this system works, from that very complicated understanding have grown a, a long list of, of potential therapeutic targets. And so I'll go through these one by one. So the, the first targets, of course, come from the gut, and that is trying to change the amount of food we absorb from our diet. So as a therapeutic option, you're talking about not perhaps changing your food intake, but rather changing how much energy you can extract from your diet. And drugs like Orlistat fit into that category. They change the amount of fat you can absorb. There's other interventions, gastric sleeves that prevent absorption of food by just lining the gut with some kind of in, um, impermeable membrane. And in some respects, gastric bypass surgery can also be considered a component of this. There's obviously therapies devoted to changing how well you can deposit fat. And so, again, perhaps not changing your diet or exercise regime, but rather your ability to deposit fat in the body. And in parallel with this, there's therapies being developed that change how well you can maintain glucose in the body. New therapies devoted to encouraging glucose secretion, for example. We talked a little bit about comorbidities a moment ago, and I think it's the comorbidities we really need to focus on when we're thinking about obesity therapies. In particular, diabetes is a critical comorbidity, and so improving insulin secretion in the late phases of diabetes is a, is a very important therapeutic horizon, I think. And there's, there's new therapies, that we call them GLP-1 therapies, that are devoted to increasing insulin secretion. In parallel, those same therapies appear to also improve insulin action, which is, again, a critical component of what's going wrong in diabetes. So in, that, that, I think the, the focus on diabetes with an obesity therapy is a, a therapeutic horizon that's really rapidly approaching us. And we have one drug on the market now that addresses this topic, and I think in the future there's going to be a raft of them appearing. I think they represent a, a sort of a, a, quite a quantum leap in terms of how we can treat this comorbidity. Um, the, now, we, we really need to consider that the, the obesity comorbidities are what the, you're presenting with as an acute healthcare complication, and so from a reimbursement perspective, focusing on the comorbidities makes a lot of sense. And these other comorbidities represent hypertension and dyslipidemia, as we've spoken about. Now, my lab's focus, and I think the general scientific community's perspective, is that obesity is a CNS.